In the first couple of days of uh, Mises University, you're uh, given the basic, Im most important concept, uh, really the foundation of the understanding of all of the market economy, of what Mises likes to call catalactics. And this is a principle of economic calculation. You'll see this uh, fully developed and the implications that come from it uh, in, in the first couple of days of uh, lectures and discussions. What we want to talk about uh, now, though, is uh, price theory. What what's uh, the uh, economic, uh, the sound economic uh, analysis of the determination of prices? Because price theory is the is really the the cornerstone of this foundation of economic calculation. And economic calculation again is the foundation upon which rests our understanding of the market economy. And well, I don't have to tell this crowd that the market economy is the foundation of uh, civilization. So there's a progression that you're gonna go through in the next few days. Now, <clears throat> in, this, uh, in this hour, we'll uh, move through four steps. So first I wanna talk about some of the fundamentals of human action, because this again is, uh, Dr. Gordon will talk about in the next lecture is the foundational method of economics, the praxeological method. So we start with the human person and human action, and then we show the implications logically of uh, what, what comes from this uh, with respect to our social interactions and, and so on. So we'll start with that, and then we'll spend a little bit of time about uh, talking about what I call the personal economy. In other words, the logic of how you and I act just in our own personal lives. And, and then we'll talk about the social economy, which is the main show, right? Of how we each take our personal economies and we integrate them into a social nexus. You know, why do we do this? And what are the implications of doing this? And, and so on. And this, of course, is where we get uh, the theory of price. <clears throat> okay, so let's begin. Human action uh, is purposeful behavior. Human action is goal-oriented. Human action uh, has a motive, which is to attain the end that the person has in mind in uh, acting in one way uh, relative to another. Uh, we, the first thing we notice right away about, um, about having an end is that having an end is not sufficient uh, for uh, the attainment of the end. We all have unmet ends, right? Uh, not just wishing that they could be attained. Uh, 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 this is not sufficient for them to actually be attained because we're finite beings. We have to uh, identify and acquire and, uh, and employ means in action to attain our ends. Uh, we know also that uh, using means is not uh, capable of fully or uh, completely satisfying ends that when we engage in action, our, our ends are somewhat satisfied and temporarily satisfied, but uh, they appear again or different ones appear again. <clears throat> and so we're always in this uh, situation where some of our ends are unmet. We have some things we'd like to accomplish uh, that we have not yet accomplished. <clears throat> so our means are uh, scarce, as we say, in economics. <clears throat> the second thing about means is that they're somewhat uh, convertible to different productive activities or uses. We understand this right away from thinking about our own labor, right? We know that we can do different things, different activities. We can shift our labor around from one thing to another and combine it with different other means, uh, land and you know, natural resources and cons uh, capital goods in different uh, combinations of production. So this means that when we engage in action uh, to be purposeful, we, we need to value which ends to pursue out of all those that we deem feasible given our circumstances and the means that we possess. And then for every end that we uh, choose as feasible because we value it highly enough, we would have to also choose the combination of means that we want to organize, given again our circumstances, that we would want to organize in order to attain uh, or strive at least to attain the end uh, uh, that we have chosen. So we have these choice 
um, uh, margins in uh, human action, right? <clears throat> and this gets us to, then to the central mode of human action w w that economists uh, uh, recognize, which is the principle that uh, Mises likes to call economizing, that our action is always economizing. In other words, we're always striving to attain higher valued ends and set lesser valued ends aside, again, given our circumstances and the way that we assess the value of things and so on. <clears throat> and uh, for any given end that we choose to pursue, we always choose the combination of means that we assess at that time that we act as uh, having uh, less value than, uh, for, for a given end that we can attain, as opposed to other combinations of, uh, of uh, ends that have higher value or, or higher cost, right, in action. So we're always economizing on both margins with respect to, to a human action. <clears throat> now, when we economize, since means are scarce, and we have these choice parameters, uh, we're always expressing a preference. We're always choosing one alternative relative to another, so that our valuations are always um, rank ordered or relative to one another <clears throat> and never uh, just abstractions, right? So this is the principle to keep in mind when we're doing economic analysis. Now let's get to uh, the subjectivity of value, or maybe we should say more accurately, uh, what are some of the logical uh, conditions um, that exist with respect to the way that we value things? And the first of these economists call subjectivity. And subjectivity of value means that value is an intensive state of mind that value is a state of mind that lacks any extensive property. It doesn't exist uh, anywhere except in a human mind. <clears throat> and if it lacks an extensive property, then certain things are implied. Namely, uh, we can't come up with a unit of value that's useful interpersonally. It, it doesn't make any sense, right? We can't make sense of me saying, I get 10 units of value from uh, drinking a bottle of water and you saying, well, I get more because I get 12. You see, we don't, if we don't share what a unit means, well, then we, we, we can't talk this way. It doesn't, it's just uh, nonsense speak to talk this way, right? <clears throat> and because of this, it, what follows, of course, is that it's not possible to make uh, quantitative comparisons of the value that different people place on different things and it isn't possible to use subjective value to determine what is more valuable to people in society as opposed to less valuable. The people on my right value you know, water to drink and people on my left value soda pop or something else, right? We can't add up values or treat them as uh, uh, substances that are subject to measurement. The second thing about value that we recognize just from our own actions, or therefore it's fundamental to human action, is that value, subjective value lacks constancy with respect to external circumstances. There isn't any known fixity of response that we have subjectively in valuing circumstances in the externally that are of interest to us that change. When the price of something that we're interested in buying goes up, there, there is no principle that says, well, if it goes up by 5%, our, our quantity demand, you know, our preferences and our quantity demand go up by 10%. There's no quantitatively fixed relationship here. There's a lack of constancy in a quantitative sense between external circumstances and subjective valuations. By the way, these, th these two principles speak then against uh, mathematical treatments of utility or value in economic analysis. Again, later in the, in the week, you'll hear perhaps more uh, detail about um, uh, problems like this. I think, uh, uh, I think Jonathan Newman has a special session on this later in the week. Uh, okay, so 
uh, just to finish up on this line, uh, if value is in, in human action fundamentally is subjective, then so is cost. If, if, there's a, if there's a choice always between what we value more highly and what we value less highly when we aim at some end in action, then both the value and the cost, that is the value of what we attain and the value of what we give up, the cost, are subjective fundamentally in human action. <clears throat> uh, and, and then it follows, uh, of course, directly from this, that every human action is motivated by a value difference. We always aim at an action because we think there's a value difference between what we'll attain by pursuing the end we choose and what we forego by giving up uh, the pursuit of the end that uh, we, we uh, set aside, right? And by the way, um, again, just as an aside, that'll be taken up later in other lectures. Um, economists make no, Austrian economists, make no assumption about the, um, uh, the particulars by which people come to these assessments and choices, right? Uh, economic analysis is not a theory of the mind or a psychological theory about how people choose between alternatives and or things of this sort. Um, it's just a logic. It's just a it's just a categorical logic, right? <clears throat> okay, so let's move on to the next step. I've mentioned a, a few uh, points that are uh, necessary for us to move on to this. So the next step, uh, and the last thing that we'll talk about just uh, under the heading of fundamentals, is this idea of value imputation. And here you can see the three uh, schools of thought view on this uh, question of value imputation. The value imputation has to do with the question of how, is, how does the cause and effect structure of value move? Wh which is cause and which is effect? Is, value, uh, is the value of consumer good caused by the value we have in our minds? And is, is therefore the value of producer goods that can produce the consumer good caused by the value of the consumer good as the Austrians would hold? Or is it the reverse as the British classical school held um, most famously in the work of Karl Marx in the labor theory of value? Is value an inherent property of a factor of production like labor? Is value just a property of labor, like, uh, like uh, energy? And therefore, if you use a bunch of labor to produce something, does that value get transmitted to the consumer good through the act of production? Does it get accumulated into the consumer good <clears throat> by an act of production? And then does the mind uh, assent to this value? That would be uh, the British classical or cost of production theory. And then the neoclassical theory, at least in Alfred Mar Marshall, is this uh, mutual determination theory where there are independent causal, not really causal factors, but independent factors that affect the, uh, the value of a consumer good from both directions. And we won't, again, I won't say any more about this. You'll have some follow-up in later uh, lectures in the, in the week about this possibility, but all, all I'll say here about all this is only the Austrian theory of imputation of value is consistent with the basic fundamental um, concept of human action, which is all human action aims at the attainment of an end. And therefore means are always have derivative value. They, they, they can't be valued independently from the from the value of the end to which we will we'll put them. In other words, if we could attain an end just by snapping our fingers, instead of going through the arduous process of accumulating and using means and so on, waiting for the production process to be finished and all that other stuff, we would prefer it. Right? We, we do that instead, right? <clears throat> so so this, is the, this is the principle of imputation. Now let me give you a, a uh, we're gonna move to the personal uh, 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 economy and personal valuation. So let me give you a personal example to illustrate. <clears throat> My wife and I live uh, on a couple of wooded acres. Uh, we bought a house there uh, 20 years ago, actually, um, uh, outside of Grove City, Pennsylvania. 
And uh, the house has a uh, walkout basement. And it's a two-story house with a walkout basement. So there are three stories in the back of the house, right? Walk out. So my wife and I have uh, wanted to build a deck uh, that, where you could walk out of the second story, which is the, like the first story of the house. You could just walk out and, you know, be on the deck outside. <laughs> and the reason why we... We, we value this is because we can put this consumer good, this would be a consumer good for us. We could put this consumer good to uh, all sorts of ends that we find valuable. We could entertain with our friends on the deck. We could, uh, including our students, right? We could have them over and, you know, could uh, have a barbecue and eat, eat on the deck. And, and, or we could just, you know, get up in the morning and have coffee on the deck and watch the beautiful sunrise. You know, there's a lot, just a lot of uh, subjective value that we could attain from having the deck that we can't now enjoy. So because, because we want the enjoyment, we value the deck, right? The consumer good is valuable to us. And of course, we want it configured in a particular way and so on and so forth, right? But, but that's where the value of the deck comes from. It comes from my wife and I's value of the ends that we could attain if we had the deck and used it as a consumer good. Now, because we, because we value the consumer good, we also value the producer goods that could be used to produce it. And we'll talk about this in a minute, but uh, we're not going to produce it ourselves. <laughs> so, um, so we're going to hire, we're going to enter into this, we're going to integrate our personal economy with the social economy and find someone in the division of labor to produce it for us or some group to produce it for us. And the group that we, uh, the, the company that we hired is called more than a carpenter. And the entrepreneur that runs this, is, his first name is Josh, Joshua, right? So we hire Joshua, but you know, we, we sit down over a table and we have this negotiation. He lays out the plans. We you know, talk about the price and we, we settle all that. And we, we decide, okay, we value the, having the deck enough that we're willing to pay the monetary price in order to have Joshua buy the inputs and assemble them and produce the deck, right? That's how, that's how human action works. That, that's what we're talking about. That's how the personal economy, this is, this is what we can explain um, uh, uh, usefully or give a universal uh, explanatory account of uh, anyone's personal action. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so we'll make some further remarks about the deck in a minute. Okay, so in thinking one more step about the personal economy, on this slide I've got, I've got the fundamental principle of the valuation of consumer goods on the left and producer goods on the right. When we're just thinking about personal valuation now. And you can see on the left, uh, this is the principle of uh, the laws of utility or what sometimes is called diminishing marginal utility. So my wife and I value the first deck at a certain extent, because with the first deck, we can do all sorts of things. We can accomplish all of these valuable things that I've already mentioned. But, but if we had a second deck in addition to our first, yeah, there are some additional ends that we could val you know, attain that we can't value at the first. For example, we could build the second deck off of our master bedroom which is also on the same level of the house as where our current deck is. And then, you know, well, okay, so now early in the morning, we could just walk out for our bedroom. We wouldn't have to go into the other parts of the house. Yeah. Not very valuable, right? Not very valuable. We could do it. I mean, if someone were to say, oh, just, you know, we give you the deck or something, maybe we would take it. But you can see that the, the, the value of the second unit of a good of equal serviceability is always ranked lower than the first because I think Joe Salerno already explained this to you, right? The first unit is applied to the most valuable ends that the person has in mind. And having satisfied those, the second unit could only be applied to a, the second most valuable set of ends. And so it's less valuable. So this is the principle of diminishing marginal utility or the, uh, one of the laws of utility. And then the second law of utility, or excuse me, the second law of, of importance for us with producer goods is called the law of returns that I've illustrated on the right-hand side. Now here I have to use a uh, hypothetical example. 
suppose suppose on our wooded acres, my wife and I had a uh, had a stream that ran through the property. Actually, we just had this little kind of puddling thing. <clears throat> but suppose we had a real stream, and there were, there were fish in the, the you know were in the stream, so it was an active. Uh, what do they call it, uh, ecosystem. <clears throat> um, and, and so, you know, we like to fish. But if we went out in the morning one day and we fished and we caught four fish using our complementary factors of production, right? We, we can't, we're not fishing just with labor, but we're using the natural resources and we've got, um, we've got worms and poles and hooks and, oh, so, and so on and so forth. If we then try to apply another unit of these complementary factors, another unit of labor, however long this takes, an hour, um, our so-called marginal physical product would go down. And if it didn't go down right away, it would go down eventually, right? If we just fished more and more and more, we just kept applying another hour of fishing to the fixed river and the fixed natural uh, setting, then we'd always hit diminishing returns. And this gives us then, we won't talk more about this, but this gives us the law of returns. And these two principles you'll find again important in talking about uh, this uh, principle of economizing and uh, economic calculation later on. <clears throat> uh, okay, so let's turn to the social economy uh, because when we talk about the social economy, the main point to see is that the personal valuations that we engage in, that say my wife and I engage in, or that you engage in when you choose to do various things, acquire different consumer goods or engage in acts of production or whatever it might be, are, are entirely insufficient. They're logically incapable, in fact, of organizing production in a division of labor, of economizing in a division of labor. And again, for the, for the purposes we have in front of us, let, let's just uh, think about this from the viewpoint of Josh, the entrepreneur who runs uh, more than a carpenter. When Josh sits down at the table, our kitchen table, and starts discussing building our deck, and he, said, he makes a, a, uh, an offer, a price offer to us, I can, I'll do that, you know, we say, okay, we want it like this, and he says, okay, I can do it like that for X price, and we agree to this, then, then he has our demonstrated preference, right? He has our, he has our subjective value uh, demonstrated to him relative to money. And now he has a, a metric, an objective metric that he can use relative to other customers who would also like to use his services, who, who he's also sat down at kitchen tables with, right? And said, and they've said, you know, I want a deck that looks like this. And he says, here's my offer to build a deck. And they say, oh, oh, oh no, no thanks. That's way too much. Or, you know, I, oh, by the way, I can get it done over here from, you know, Joe's decking service for half that or whatever. And so, and so Josh walks away. And, and when, he, when he makes his decisions based upon monetary prices and monetary considerations, you can see this is what we want to show in the lecture, uh, uh, in the rest of the lecture, is that he is in fact basing his decisions on an objective metric that is uh, indicative of the comparison of different people's preferences relative to money, not a direct a comparison of their preferences, which can't be done, but a comparison of their preferences relative to an objective standard, which is the money price. And, and he, he can therefore allocate his resources toward those that uh, value the good relative to money more than someone else. This can now be objectively known. Right? So that, that's what we're speaking about when we talk about appraisement in the uh, in the uh, social uh, in, in a social process of deciding how to use resources in a division of labor. <clears throat> okay, so here's here's the uh, here's the logical flow chart. If you don't remember anything else about the lecture, this is the main thing. This is a logical flow chart of how prices are determined and how they form the basis of economic calculation for making these decisions. 
So we start at the very top. So we've explained this already, right? We just have preferences. We have my wife and I, and we have our preferences. And, we, and here's Josh sitting across the table, and he has his preferences. He, what he's doing is just he's, built, he's, uh, he's uh, organizing things according to what he thinks is best for his own personal economy, right? He's running his business because he thinks that's what is best for him to do for his family and his personal life whether he sells to us or someone else. That, that, that's an open question, right? So that's what we're doing. So, uh, so he's the supplier. Yeah, whoa, that doesn't work, does it? He's the supplier on the left of the deck. My wife and I are the demanders on the right of the deck. Notice says, Jill Salerno likes to emphasize the price is caused by our recognition that there is a mutually advantageous trade, and we'll get to the logic of this in more depth in a minute, there's a mutually advantageous trade at certain prices that we can agree upon. So we agree upon the price first, and then the price is the cause of the expenditure that we make, right, on the right-hand side as the consumer. We make the expenditure, and the expenditure that we make is revenue for Josh, for the entrepreneur. Same thing, right? The price, the price that we agreed upon for building the deck was $30,000. But that price was determined by our negotiation that this was mutually advantageous to us. The expenditure didn't determine that price, quite, quite the opposite. It's always the opposite uh, cause and effect uh, uh, order, right? It's very important to emphasize this because, again, as Joe Salerno has pointed out, uh, almost all of uh, mainstream macroeconomics uh, inverts this order. In fact, they don't talk about prices at all. They just talk about expenditures. <clears throat> well, in any case, uh, w once we agree to this and we go through with the deal, right, uh, we, we make the payment, and now Josh has $30,000. He has, he has the revenue, the revenue for the entrepreneur, right? And because he gets his revenue, it influences what he can pay, his demand, for producer goods. And in fact, during the process where he was constructing the deck, he hired two new workers. How did he know how much, how did he know he wasn't overpaying them? How did he know, in other words, that they were the low opportunity cost workers? He could have interviewed a whole bunch of workers and they're all, you know, capable, right? They could do the carpentry work that, or construction work that he, he requested. But if he makes a price offer to them saying, wh whatever it is, right, I'll pay you $60,000 a year to, you know, come and do this kind of work for me. And one of the candidates says, oh, no way, that's low ball. I'm the, no way would I work for that price. And then he finds another worker, a potential worker, and he offers the same thing. And that worker says, well, sure, that's great. Of course I'll do it. Now he has an objective metric to tell whose opportunity cost is the lowest. Who, who values the, the compensation that's being paid relative to the alternative, the opportunity cost, more than the other potential worker, right? And so he's able to make an economizing, a socially economizing decision about who to hire. So that's where we get demand for the producer goods. And then, and then my bent arrow around the left, of course, is, is, the, is the preference not of not of uh, my wife and I in my example, but the preference of the workers that work for Josh. They're the ones supplying the producer, well, well uh, that uh, labor in the, in the business, right? And there are other producer goods that Josh has to buy. He has to go to the lumber store and buy the, the materials and so on and so on. He has to go to, you know, uh, um, uh, some uh, uh, outfit that would sell him the, uh, the circuit or saws that he uses, or he has to go to the Ford dealer and buy a new truck, or you know whatever the inputs are that he's using. <laughs> now the last thing that I'll well, so so we get costs at the bottom, right? Josh can, Josh can determine how to minimize his monetary cost by by arranging his you know who who he's going to buy his inputs from, and by doing this, he's actually keeping social opportunity costs lower. Because just like my example with hiring a worker, he, he, he's always gauging what the, what the uh, service of the input is relative to the money payment he has to make. <laughs> and so he can tell when someone's opportunity cost is, I mean, he doesn't have to think that way. He can tell when he's getting a better deal. That's all he has to know, right? 
And then, and then of course, the last thing uh, uh, on the uh, for Josh uh, on the and the workers and so on, the suppliers on the far left to bottom. This is what generates income. And so, so this this uh, flowchart completely closes the loop. How, how do how do my wife and I have the monetary income in order to pay thirty thousand dollars to buy the deck? Where does that come from? You know, are we just uh, you know, it's white privilege, I guess, right? We're just you know, <laughs> it's it's a drop. You know, there's a cornucopia that just kind of pours out on the white folks and not on others and. You know, that's where it comes. It's, it's arbitrary, right? It's, or, or it's um, socially manipulable or something of the sort. But, but what economic analysis shows is this income is generated by the service that each person provides to the satisfaction of the ends of other people. So my wife and I have jobs and we, you know, do, do a useful employment. How's, how do we know this useful? Well, people pay us to do it, right? How do we know that Josh is, uh, you know, a construction worker is useful? Well, Josh pays him. And if he stops being useful or useful enough, uh, Josh will fire him. So don't, don't tell that to Grove City College. But, okay, so that's the, that's the logic of, uh, of what we're doing. Now, what we want to do with the rest of the time is uh, go through the, so, some of the more specifics. We're going to sort of work through a couple of specific cases about pricing, and we're going to probably just get through the consumer goods stage. So, so probably just the top three lines of my argument, right? Uh, okay, so we're going to start this way. Oh, uh, first, I, I do have a, I do have a slide just to, summarizing what we said before. So I'm not going to go through this again, but. The entrepreneur is able to make these decisions. You'll see this later of economic calculation and appraise whether or not certain decisions are uh, generating a profit, generating revenue to cover costs, as we just explained, right? And uh, uh, when an entrepreneur is wanting to buy assets, like buying, you know, Josh wants to buy a new truck or whatever it is, and to own uh, assets as opposed to just buying inputs and, and using them in the production process, the entrepreneur can use the form of economic calculation that we call equity. So profit and equity are the forms of economic calculation. And of course, it hopefully it goes without saying that when, when Josh sits down, again, across the kitchen table with my wife and I, and he says, I'll do this job for $30,000, it's a speculation. Right. That is, he's speculating that that's going to be profitable. He doesn't know for sure that it's going to be profitable. He, he doesn't know what his cost structure is going to look like going forward. It took him a couple months to actually do the project. He doesn't know for sure, right? He doesn't know what price inflation is going to look like in those, in those several months. He doesn't, he's, he's just, he's anticipating, right, the outcome. And so this is what in Austrian economics is called appraisement. So what Josh is doing when making production decisions, I'm going to do this job for you for this price, is not looking at past economic calculation results. He's projecting or anticipating or speculating with respect to uh, what will happen monetarily if he engages in this project. And so, so, so this is the this is the point to stress here. All right, let, let's move on to these two cases. So this is a case, uh, hopefully you can see just from the uh, items I have in the preference ranks. This is a case of a, of a trade of a used consumer good. And the used consumer good I picked is an iPhone 13. So this is a two-year-old iPhone, right? We're on iPhone, iPhone 15 now. So the, thir uh, the iPhone 13 is owned by person B and person A does not own the iPhone 13, but knows person B, they know each other, and right? And person A, you know, at some price, would be willing to acquire it. So, so it thinks it's a nice phone. Maybe person A just has a flip phone or whatever. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, wouldn't mind having a used one. Doesn't want to pay for a new one, you know, wouldn't mind having a used one. And so that's what the preference rank indicates, right? That in order to have a voluntary exchange between two parties, 
they have to have preferences that are in the reversed order of the good relative to a sum of money. And so you can see, in, I've construed the example to illustrate this, right? Person A values the iPhone 13, which person A doesn't have, hence the parenthesis, uh, more than $450, and yet person B who owns the iPhone 13, no parenthesis around the iPhone, uh, would accept uh, a the minimum price the person B would accept to trade away the iPhone 13 is $425, parenthesis around that because the person, person B doesn't have $425 from person A, right? So they can, make a, they can make a voluntary exchange for their mutual benefit. Notice the price at which they make this trade is already entailed in the trade itself. It's not a separate element of making the trade, right? Again, when my wife and I sit across the table from Josh, it's not like, oh yeah, I like the deck. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, do it. Now, and, and, then, and then once he's done, he gets us the price. No, no, it's not the way it works. The price is, is just an entailed feature of the whole process of trading. It comes first, before the expenditure or the revenue. Uh, so the price, as long as there's a advantageous, a mutually advantageous price between the minimum selling price that the seller would accept and the maximum buying price that the buyer would offer, then, then we can have a voluntary trade. And the voluntary trade is obviously then uh, mutually beneficial. Now, just so we see the, uh, the, the uh, universal features involved in this, because this will be critical for looking at our second case. They look like this. Every time a, we have a buyer who, who demands a good, we have these preferences of the buyer. And they always look the same, just like I had on the previous slide, right? They always look exactly the same in logic, which is the, there's a value of the good obtained to the buyer, and there's a value of the money given up that the buyer gives up to the seller, right? So those are the two things. The buyer of the iPhone 13 gives up whatever they agree to the price, gives up, let's say, $430 to the seller. And so the buyer, the buyer of the iPhone must value the iPhone more than retaining the $430, right? And so the value of the money given up to the seller, the opportunity cost of buying the good, could have one of two categorical uses. One is the person just keeps the money, just keeps it on hand for some use in the future. They just don't buy the good. They just walk away and say, no, that price is too high. Or what the buyer could do alternatively is find the most eager alternative seller. Buyer, the person A doesn't have to buy from person B. Person A could get on the web and search around and see whether or not someone else is offering an iPhone 13 at a price better than, say, whatever the seller is offering. <clears throat> so, the, by the way, these are universal principles. When we get to the second case, which is, what if somebody wants to buy a brand new iPhone 15 from Apple? The demand supply conditions are exactly the same. There is no difference. There couldn't, it's categorically, logically necessary that it looks like this. The circumstances are different, but not the logic of it. They're, it's exactly the same. And here's the seller the same thing, right? We saw this already with person B. The seller values the money to be received more than retaining the, the good. If, if, if they don't, they won't sell. <laughs> that, that's just the logic of selling, right? <clears throat> and then the question is, well, what, what's the opportunity cost of, for the seller of selling, you know, giving away the good, selling away the good? And the, and the answer is either the seller just retains the good and keeps using it as a phone, right? They just keep using, they can just keep using their consumer good the way they were before. They give that up now if they sell it. Or uh, they could, if they don't think that buyer A has made the best offer, they could just shop around, right? They could just go and, on the internet and shop around their iPhone 13 and see if the, they could find a buyer that would offer a better price than $430 or whatever the, the buyer is willing to offer. But that's it, right? If you have a good, you can either keep it or you can sell it. Well, of course, you could give it away, right? You keep it or transfer it to someone else. That's it. Those are your options, logically. It's, it's the same for Tim Cook. He's got iPhones. He could either keep them or give them away, you know, transfer their, the ownership of them. 
It, there's no, there's nothing in his circumstances that changes that. Uh, okay. So now we're going to get to uh, the, the, uh, the principle. We want to emphasize one, one more time these principles that we developed before, the law of demand. Remember that these must operate too. I'm just reminding you that of the law of demand and the law of supply it must also, of course, be in operation. And we'll see in a minute why or, or the exact implication of these laws in, economic, in uh, Austrian economic analysis. <clears throat> uh, okay, so here's the way that we would think about this in a kind of formal way, right? If we were to you know, draw a, a graph and so on and so forth, it would look like this. And notice that what, what I've assumed here is that buyer A and buyer B settle on a price of $430, that the quantity traded at that moment across all the world of trading iPhone 13, the quantity traded is 210 units. So that's the P star, Q star. In other words, that's the data point. So, so to put this the other way around, what Austrian economists are doing is explaining actual prices and trade volumes right now in the world. We're not explaining hypothetical prices. We're not explaining long-run equilibrium or anything like that. We're explaining the actual prices that people are paying and the actual amounts of goods that are being traded at any moment in actual markets in real time. That's what we're explaining. <laughs> and you'll notice that because, because that's our explanation, um, the, the argument that uh, economists, uh, Austrian economists make with respect to this sort of formal treatment is that um, the price of $430 clears the market. There's no such thing as realized non-market clearing prices. N not in the real world, there's no such thing because what is market clearing? Market clearing is a price at where the quantity demand and quantity supplied are the same. But in every trade, the quantity demand and the quantity supplied are the same in every voluntary exchange. So if we just have 210 exchanges of iPhone 13s at some moment on July 15th, 2024, then, then each seller and each buyer, it, it, uh, their trade has cleared the market for them, right? As Misa says, each of the pairs of traders is now in a plain state of rest once they, once they cease their, the trade between them. They're in a plain state of rest which means that if we look at a snapshot out into the world and there are 210 trades at, again, on July 15th at uh, 10.05 a.m. in the morning, it must mean that each of the pairs of traders have, have uh, made a trade that clears the market between them. And therefore, in the aggregate, the, the market clears. You see the logic of this? <laughs> or to put it differently, the blue lines that I've depicted here that run intersection between point A are not data points. They're just conjectures of the law of supply and demand. They're, they're not data points. If, 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 you, if you see this in neoclassical economics, these are all data points. No, 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 they're not data points. There's only one data point, and, and that's the market clearing price. And then, of course, at the next moment, there could be a different market clearing price, and then there'd be another data point. But those data points are not connected along a demand curve or along a supply curve. They're, they're independent market clearing activities of people in the market. You know, sometimes our, you know, these analytics sometimes are, are more misleading than they're helpful because they cover up that, that, they tend to cover up that nuance that's involved that the Austrians bring out. Okay, real quickly, case two. What if we look at brand new iPhones? <clears throat> What if we look at what's happening in the market right now for the sale of iPhone 15s? Well, what we see is something like this. Again, if we were to draw a graph of it, which again, we'll admit is not, you know, has certain misleading features to it. This time the graph is not just depicting what's happening in a moment. It's depicting what Apple Inc. thinks, what the entrepreneurs at Apple Inc. think is going to happen for the entire model year which I've dated from October 15th, 2023 to October 15th, 2024. Why do it this way? Well, because Apple has a policy of announcing the price of their model, uh, right, when it goes on sale, when you can get on the, their website and or start ordering it 
uh, on April 15th, or excuse me, on October 15th, whatever the date is, 23rd or whatever the date was when they started selling it. And they keep the price exactly the same all through the year. So you could still buy an iPhone 15 for 799, the basic model, right, for 799. Now, just like you could back in, it doesn't matter, price inflation, who cares? They don't, interest rate, they don't care. It's always the same. This is, this is their entrepreneurial uh, business strategy. And they leave it the same. And then the question is, where do they come up with this asking price? And the answer is, well, the answer is sort of depicted the, the, the argument is behind the depiction, but the answer is depicted in the graph. Th they think that, the, that over the model year, if they price the good at P star, $799, they're gonna maximize the revenue that they get for the model year sales. They, they think, in other words, if they ask instead, if they ask $850 for the iPhone 15 over the model year, they're gonna get less revenue. Yeah, they'll get more revenue per sale, but they'll sell less because there's a law of demand. And, and they think, you know, if we lowered the price to 750, yeah, we'd sell more, but we'd actually get less revenue because we'd lose $49 on each sale than, than we could have if we, if we left the price at 789. They, they think this is the best price. And so they just leave the price there. And I'll leave it as a homework problem for you to figure out. You could do this at lunch. Um, what would the moment to moment graphs look like, like today, some iPhone 15s will be sold today at three o'clock across the whole world, some number, right? And they'll be at $799. What would a graph look like if you drew it out of that? And then what would it look like if you drew it for lots of different moments? What, what would the graph look like? That, that's sort of an interesting exercise that I suggest you uh, engage in. And then one last point about this, you notice that if, if, uh, if um, Tim Cook and his entrepreneurial group, if my assessment of what they're doing proves to be correct, they'll earn $15.98 billion in revenue from the, from the sale of the iPhone 15. And just like Josh getting our, my wife and I, $30,000 from selling us a deck, uh, Tim Cook and his entrepreneurial group use this revenue to buy inputs and to acquire assets to run the business. They're doing the same kind of economic calculation that Josh is doing. You know, will I generate enough revenues to cover my costs if we get a revenue stream that looks like this? What would the cost structure look like? How's it gonna change over time? You know, uh, what, what, uh, if we build profit, what sort of investments can we make in assets and build up our capital structure? What sort of projects would we, uh, you know, fund, additional projects would we fund with, the, with these, uh, uh, revenues, that we, you know, these revenues that we were not using to buy inputs to produce iPhones, what other projects would we engage in and invest in and so on and so forth? So at that point, uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, stop. So thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you.